Alicia, hello, hello. Make sure my volume's turned up. Let's see here. Teresa Burns. Good evening, good evening. Uh, Cricket, what's up? Kenneth Goodner, hello, buddy. Sherry, what's up? Good to see you on here. Royal Chapman, what's up, buddy? I got to watch your uh, video you just did for Language Matters. Good job, buddy, as always. I'm trying to get comfortable here. Get comfortable so we can get started. Hope you're doing well, Roy. That was good, man. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Ruben, good to see you. Katie, hello, hello. Jenny Lang, good evening, good evening. Chris James in the house. What's up, preacher man? Royal, good evening. Olivia, what's up, girl? Nick, time for truck church. Wayne, good evening, buddy. Where's Sharon at? You better let her watch, too. Chris, not too much, man. I had a good day. I am my brother. Good, good deal, good deal. Uh, hey, Royal, how long did y'all... Um, how long is that interview that you guys did? Is it like a 30 minute deal or an hour deal? I think I'm doing it in September. I've been watching them though, but I just can't remember how long they are. Kudos for taking those girls on a date. Man, we had a good time. They had a blast. <laughs> they had a, Esmeralda, what's up girl? Yeah, they had a good time. James Reese, what's up buddy? Good to see you, welcome home. That's one of my buddies right there that just came home from Torres and wherever else he had to go. Sharon, good to see you on here. Jenny Cole, that's mama right there. Hello, hello. Supposed to be 30 minutes. Did y'all go over? <laughs> that's a lot to say in 30 minutes. Let's see who else is on here. Trisha Fuller, hi from Cameron and Trisha. Hello, hello. Uh, hope everybody's doing well tonight. Sun's going down. I think we're having that meteor shower tonight. Hope I get to see that. I'm gonna come see you next weekend. Okay, not this weekend, but next weekend, right? This weekend I'll be out of town, but next weekend I'll be I'll be home. But you know how good it gets and turn to an hour. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh-oh, Don Freeman in the house. Don Freeman, man, I miss you, Don. I got to see you sometime soon. Let's see. I see Natalia popping up on there. Okay, cool, Chris. Yeah, this weekend I'll be out of town, but next weekend I'll be here. Are you still going to call your girls' midgets when they get out of eye with you? Yes, I will. Don, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, we're having that meteor shower tonight. I don't think it starts till like 11, like 11 to 4 or something, but it's going to be like 30 to 50 shooting stars every hour or something like that, so I'd like to try to watch some of that before I... I will see you on the 24th. Is it the 24th? It's the 28th, right? Let me know. I think it's the 28th, though. But let me know, because that's the day that I asked off for. <laughs> What's the 28th? Debbie, how are you and Alan doing? Man, it's good to see all my friends on here. I love my friends. Love seeing you on here. We're going to get started here in just a minute, giving everybody a couple of minutes to get on here. Then we'll pray and we'll jump in here. We've gotten real deep the last couple of weeks. Hopefully everybody's brain is not fried, but hope y'all like that uh, that series we did on illusions. If you didn't see that, that's probably my two favorite truck churches that we've ever done. Some deep, deep stuff that you're not going to hear on a regular Sunday morning, but extra prayers needed for the McConnell unit today. Uh-oh, what happened there? Don't listen to me. I'm out of my lane. <laughs> okay, so it is the 28th. I will be there on the 28th. Man, I was... I was sure sad, man. I thought I was going to miss it when I got that first date, uh, whatever that date was. I wasn't uh, this Friday. Whatever the team said is right. Okay, the 28th. I did not want to miss that. I love being a part of that. Since we can't uh, travel and fly to different states and go to different prisons uh, because of COVID, we started a two-day workshop just flying all over, going to prisons all over the country. And uh, so since we can't go in right now, we're going to record the program and send it into the prisons. So that's what Don and I are talking about. Chloe is ready to watch it. The meteor shower. Okay, awesome. Vicky, what's up? Hopefully you and Willie are doing well. Tommy, good to see you on here, buddy. Wendy Ellis is here. Good to see you. Hope everybody's doing well. And you have on your Shawshank. I do. I do. This shirt means something to me. I love it. We went to the, the prison up there at Shawshank. 
And then at uh, the back of this shirt says, get busy living or get busy dying. And I love, I love this shirt. Don Freeman had me shaking as well, saying the 24th. Hey, that's all right. She's got people that take care of that for her, so she's good. They're gonna help her out. Yeah, uh, we flew we flew up there and got to see the Shawshank Redemption prison. And uh, I saw the back of this shirt where it said, get busy living or get busy dying. And man, I, I, I love that, that saying, man. It's become a motto of mine. Michael Rollmine, what's up, buddy? Everybody doing good tonight. Good to see everybody rolling in here. So yeah, we went real deep the last couple weeks. Um, I'm not gonna limit God. I don't think we're gonna go as deep as we did the last two weeks. But uh, I just want to talk about some real life stuff today, stuff I'm going to share some of my day with you and then tie it into some scriptures. Today was just a crazy God day all day long, so he's just had my, my wheels turning. Not much. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Mike. So we will give it two more minutes or, yeah, two minutes or less, and then we'll, we'll pray and get started and everybody else can roll in a little bit late. So hopefully everybody's doing well. Good to see everybody here. Carol Johnson, my first grade teacher right there. Love that lady. Everybody's rolling in. Yeah, Tuesday nights has been working out pretty good. Seems like everybody's everybody's free. Jennifer Martin, man, always good to see you on here. That's my buddy right there. How are y'all doing? They Their house caught on fire a couple of weeks ago and pretty much lost everything. Jennifer, it's good to see you. Thank you for, you for being here. Hope you're doing well. That's awesome. I'm sure they will enjoy it either way since you're not able to fly out to the prisons. Oh, they'll love it. Becky Warren, North Carolina, good to see you. One more minute. We'll pray in and get started. So. Do, 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 do. I'm ready to get started. Yeah, Royal, y'all did really good today, man. I was, I was real proud of you, man. I love that campaign that's going on. Hello, hello. Go ahead and find my place in the Bible before we pray. Well, better not, because we'll probably go all over the place. So. All right. <clears throat> all right, let's uh, let's pray in. Let's get started so everybody's not waiting and just staring at me, waiting to go. So here we go. Lord God, we just thank you for this day that you've given us and blessed us with. Thank you for uh, your many blessings. Thank you for just doing life with us. Forgive us for all the times that you're there with us and we miss it. And thank you for all those times that we're there. We're here. We hear your voice and uh, we're able to be your hands and feet. And I just thank you for this day. Thank you for all the people that I ran into and none of them were accidents. Thank you, Lord, for just being involved in our daily life. I'm just shot back to the garden where you wanted to walk with Adam and Eve. And uh, you've just spent all these thousands of years trying to teach us the same thing that you just want to walk with us. And it just doesn't have to be like a Sunday morning relationship with you or a Wednesday night relationship with you lord you want to be with us all the time use us all the time and just bring honor and glory to your name so i thank you for those opportunities thank you for everybody that's watching now everybody that's going to watch later i'm sure people have prayer requests and i thank you that you know their needs you're already on top of it father god and i just thank you that you know our heart's desires father god so i just pray for everybody that's watching right now be with us as we get in your word i pray that you take over my train of thought pray that you take over my tongue, Father God, that you would say the things that you want me to say, that you would give us fresh revelation in the moment, Lord God. I just love it whenever you drop fresh stuff on me, even when I'm in the middle of trying to teach. So just be with us, Father God. Thank you for Truck Church. Thank you for all the people that it's reached, touched, and blessed, those that have been saved because of uh, what you do through Truck Church, Lord God. And thank you for all the people that are growing because of what they're learning in Truck Church. And we just give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, let me see who I missed real quick. Uh, Jennifer was in a car wreck last Thursday. Please pray for us. Goodness gracious, Jennifer, man, you're getting nailed. I'm just glad you're okay, man. You've survived a fire, now you survived a car wreck. Um, hopefully everybody was okay in that wreck. Evan L. Lambert, Miss Martin, that was one of my first Sunday school teachers. If you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. Man, that's good shit. We are going to have to do some t-shirts about that, I think. Chris Hood in the house, Melinda Shiflet, Chuck Church. Thanks, brother. To God be all the glory. Don Freeman, Secures Foundation. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, y'all ready? Let's get in it. So, uh, trying to get comfortable. Um, so here's what's going on with me, where I want to go today. I had an awesome conversation with a friend yesterday about stuff that you don't brag about, stuff that you just do uh, in your daily life that God calls you to, people that you run into, and just getting to share some really cool, amazing stories. Jeremy Mayne, good to see you on here, buddy. Um, 
just going through your life and running into things and people and being used and nobody knows about it you don't brag about it but it's just something between you and God that you're able to help somebody you run into a homeless person at the gas station or or, or whatever uh, there's a million things that could happen or whatever well I was just talking about that yesterday to a good friend of mine and I was just blown away by their stories I got to share some stories and uh, so today was my day off and so uh, man I've just had all these things that I've, I've needed to do I needed to get my truck inspected I needed to get it registered I needed a null change that was way overdue I needed to get some uh, stuff for the house uh, I needed to get some horse feed just all this stuff and I couldn't get it all done on a lunch break during the work week because it's been a crazy good um, work week and haven't had time to do all that so it's my day off I hate using my day off to run errands because I want to spend as much time with the kiddos as I can um, but I just had to take this morning to uh, do a whole bunch of errands so before I get into my day and what God did with it I want to share two of my favorite verses y'all already know <clears throat> I'm sure but uh, <coughs> even more so than that <coughs> If you've watched very many truck churches at all, you've heard these verses because I can literally tie these two verses into any topic. You throw out a topic and God will show me how to tie in these two uh, scriptures into anything. So these two scriptures are not the main bread and butter of what we're going to talk about today, but they lay a really good foundation for what I want to talk to you about. You'll have some similar experiences, I'm sure. Um, but by the end of this, I'm hoping that it will open your eyes to maybe some things that we're missing just in our daily life. Sorry, my throat's been dry. Blessings, truck pastor. <laughs> Pamela, thank you. Debbie, good to see you on here. So if you will, my very favorite verse in the world is Psalms 139.16. So let's read that one quick, and then we're going to uh, flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I want to read these two verses. Like I said, you probably already know them. <clears throat> and um, if you've watched truck church very many times, you know that I, I use these all the time. It's not because it's the only two verses I know. <laughs> it's that they, they mean uh, the most to me. And like I said, they tie into every topic that we ever talk about. Roger Hazelton, what's up, buddy? We are going to go to my verse. And I got a friend on here named Alicia that got a brand new Bible today. So I'm going to help you break that thing in. Uh, let's go to Psalms if I can find it. 139. We'll read it. I'll tell you why it's my favorite verse. We'll go to the next one, then we'll tie them in. So 139, if you back up to like verses 14 and 15, everybody knows these verses, maybe not where they're at in the Bible, but you've heard them um, read and quoted all the time. So here's what 14 says. 14 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. 15 says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. People usually quote those two verses right there whenever they're doing like self affirmations and things like that. Um, and they're good verses. I love those verses. There's nothing wrong with them. But uh, 16 usually gets skipped over, maybe because of the wording and they don't understand it or whatever. But uh, it's the verse that set me free while I was in prison. And it goes like this Psalms 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance before being unformed. And whenever I get to do the uh, Language Matters campaign, I hope I get to bring this verse up because it ties right into that as well. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written the days fashioned before me, when as yet there were none of them. Let me read it again, and then I'll kind of put it in plain English. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written the days fashioned before me, when as yet there was none of them. So I went to prison on a murder case. So uh, obviously I knew that the victim's family uh, did not like me. I know that my family was uh, upset or at least disappointed. I knew that I disappointed a whole lot of friends. And then ultimately I disappointed myself. So when I was sitting in prison, besides being in prison, which is a crazy culture, very angry, uh, just a hate-filled environment, anger all the time, besides just going through that stuff all the time, um, I had to deal with my own stuff and my own stuff was being a disappointment. I felt like this huge disappointment and then uh, five years into it, God sends this guy to me and I end up getting saved and uh, start reading and studying for, my, for myself. And one day I stumble upon this verse and this verse to me, if I could put it into even plainer English, says, God knew everything you would ever do, good and bad, before you ever lived your first day and he took the time to record it in his book. 
So what that meant to me is that God knew everything that I would ever do in life, good and bad, including being involved in this murder case. Not only did he know it, but he took the time to record it in his book before I even lived my first day. Johnny, good to see you on here. So logically, how can you be a disappointment to somebody that knows everything that you're ever going to do before you live your first day? So he knew everything I was ever going to do, good and bad, before I lived my first day. He took the time to record it in his book and chose to make me anyway. So when he was thinking about creating Jason Cole, what I was going to look like, what my personality was going to be like, what I was going to do life, good and bad, he already knew all the good. More importantly, right now for, for a conversation, he knew all the bad that I was ever going to do. He knew all the bad that I haven't even done yet, whatever is left of my life. He knew all that before I lived my first day, took the time to record it in his book, and what blesses me so much is he chose to create me anyway, because I like to picture God thinking of me and then thinking of being 21 and getting wrapped up in this murder case, how easy it would have been for him to say, you know what? I'm just not going to do this one right here. I'm just not going to make this one right here because that's a lot of drama right there. That's going to hurt a whole lot of people. Um, let's just scratch that idea and move on to the next creation. It's so easy for me, if I was God, to think like that. But God doesn't think like that. God says, I know everything he's going to do, good and bad, before he does it, before he lives his first day. I'm going to write this in my book. I'm going to create a plan to reconcile that mess that he's going to get in and I'm going to create him anyway and you know what it's worth it to me because one day he's going to receive me and I'm going to be his Lord and Savior one day he's going to accept me and begin to walk with me one day he's going to become a uh, preacher and begin to preach and teach this word and one day he's going to do homeless ministry and one day he's going to do prison ministry and one day he's going to stop teenagers from committing suicide and one day he's going to travel to the United States and do prison workshops and one day he's going to meet people in Walmart and bless them and one day and one day and one day and one day and it's worth it to God how can you logically be a disappointment to somebody that knows everything you're ever going to do good and bad and chooses to create you anyway you can't be so when you get the revelation of that scripture and you still choose to feel down depressed and disappointed that's totally on you and you're putting yourself above the God who says he's not disappointed in you you're putting yourself above him and above his judgment by choosing to continue to be disappointed in yourself you're saying that you know better than God there's a pill that you need to swallow let me say that one more time if God knows everything you're ever gonna do good and bad let's focus on the bad and chooses to create you anyway you can't logically be a disappointment to him so now that you know this truth you're left with a choice you're gonna leave truck church today either still feeling like a disappointment or you're going to leave here free letting that go if you choose to leave here after hearing this truth and still choose to be a dis feel like a disappointment still choose to live in depression and disappointment then what you have done is you have elevated yourself above god and his judgment saying that you know more than him you can't logically be a disappointment to god he knew everything that you would ever do, good and bad, before you lived your very first day and chose to create you anyway. And that is true for everybody that is breathing air today, past, and future. Freedom is a state of mind. Amen. Okay? So keep this in mind. So let's, we, I just gave you a whole lot to chew on right there, and we haven't even got into the message yet. But just chew on this part. If God knew everything, good and bad, that you were ever going to do, and he already had a plan in place before you lived your first day to reconcile all the dumb stuff we're ever going to do. That is true for not only you, but for everybody who has ever lived, is living, or will live, okay? So now let's paint a picture of us all coming together. He knows everything that all of us are ever going to do, good and bad, and chose to create all of us anyway, okay? Now go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Let's tie the two together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Joseph, say hi. What's up, buddy? Another one of my buddies from prison right there. Matter of fact, that was my celly. Love that dude. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Let's get there, get there, get there. This is good stuff, man, already. And this is not even the point. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'll give you just a second to get there. Even you, buddy. <laughs> he knew all the dumb stuff you'd ever do and chose to create you anyway and throw you in my cell. Which is pretty phenomenal. He used me to bless you back then, and he's using you to bless me now. So we're even. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Workmanship is a Greek word that means his masterpiece, his one-of-a-kind, unique masterpiece. It's a one-of-a-kind painting. I am reading that right now for my Bible study. Awesome. Workmanship, masterpiece, unique, one-of-a-kind. There's never been another one. Ray, Shake, Elliot, another prison buddy. <laughs> Church in the prison crowd. Um, you're his workmanship, one-of-a-kind unique masterpiece there has never been anything like you ever before on this planet and there will never be anything like you ever again on this planet it's all you good evening james it's all you quit spending so much time wishing that you were like somebody else quit spending so much time wishing that you had the gifts or the talents of someone else you know what i am a big fan of T.D. Jakes. I love this dude. I love his style. I like the way that he can just go and get into it and he can give you 5,000 points and by the end of the message he can wrap them all up and just hit a home run every single time. I love that dude. We got a free world volunteer um, at the Torres unit. His name was Pastor Walker. Anybody that was ever there ever heard of him? I share his videos on Thursdays. Magnificent Bible teacher. I'm talking about it's meat every time. It's relevant every time. Same thing. He can tie all these things together and, and just hit a home run every single time. When I used to hear these guys preach and God called me to preach, I'm like, what in the world were you doing calling me to preach? Whenever you got these two dudes right here that I could never live up to their standards or what they do. And I'll tell you what, man, God cares enough about us that he will go all the way out of his way to send people to us to change the way that we think and view things because God knows when I'm sitting in the audience as a man that's incarcerated watching this free world volunteer preach he knows that I have the same calling and he knows that I'm sitting there deathly intimidated that I'm never going to speak like that and one day lo and behold somehow God doing what he does it landed on a day to where um, if you were locked up on that unit the chaplaincy department had this program to where if you felt like you had the gift to speak or teach um, we had a deal every Sunday morning called the 10 minute speaker. So the, the, the man that was incarcerated would get 10 to 15 minutes to speak whatever it was that God gave him. They would do some more songs and prayer team and all that. And then the main volunteer speaker would preach. Well, it just so happens things got moved around one day to where me, I was going to be the 10 minute speaker that day. And it was pastor Walker Sunday, the guy that I just adore and, uh, just about idolized but not in an unhealthy way as far as a preacher and a teacher goes <clears throat> we landed on the same sunday and man you talk about being a nervous wreck i'm like i've got to preach in front of this guy that is the epitome of a preacher teacher to me and so uh i tried to get it out of my head and i prayed and i prayed and i prayed and man thank god i got up there and god just took over the holy spirit hit me and i preached my guts out for 10 minutes and it just turns into this big pep rally i mean it was just amazing god just fell in that place and then uh, we do some more worship. God moved crazy. We did some more worship, did the prayer team. Pastor Walker gets up there, the guy that intimidates me without even trying to, meaning to, or even knowing that he does. And he says something to the effect of, man, it's hard for me to get up here and preach after Jason. How am I gonna follow that? The guy that intimidates me stands up and says, how am I gonna follow that? And he goes off into this sermon about being God's masterpiece, that you're unique, you're one of a kind. Nobody's ever been like you before. Nobody's ever gonna be like you from after this. And he goes off into the sermon and he says, quit trying to be like somebody else. Quit being envious of somebody else's gifts and talents. We don't need another one of those. We needed that one. And what you need to realize is we need you to be what you are, what you're called to be, because you're a unique, one of a kind masterpiece as well. And he said this right here, and this is what I'll take away. Wayne said he remembers that. So this is what I took away from that, that I'll never, never forget. And he says, Jason, doesn't matter how much he reads, prays, studies, and prepares, he will never preach the way that I preach. And I'm sitting there shaking my head like, amen, yeah, I know, I'll, ne I'll, never, I'll never preach like that. And he turned around and backdoored it and he goes, no matter how much I read, pray, preach, and prepare, I'll never preach like Jason. And I, man, that hit me so hard right between the eyes man, I'm, I'm idolizing him or T.D. Jakes and all these other people. And I'm like, man, I'm never going to get there. And then the guy that I'm saying that about stands up one Sunday morning and says, no matter how hard I train myself, I'm never going to preach like Jason is. 
and it just hit me and all that th I still love Pastor Walker I still love listening to him I still love TD Jakes I still love listening to him but I can watch them with the sole purpose of learning and seeing what I can take in and turn around and teach to other people and there's nothing else going on in my mind there's no more in intimidation there's no more oh I wish I could do it like this or I wish I could do it like that God cares enough about us that he will go out of his way to help get rid of your insecurities when it comes to ministry and reaching out and using your gifts and your talents and your calling and God just blows me away so this verse you are his workmanship you're his masterpiece one of a kind unique uh, what'd you say Don God is faithful he gave he uniquely gave each one of us our journey that is our gift amen absolutely for we are his workmanship one of a kind unique masterpiece nobody will ever be like you before you got here nobody will ever be like you in the future created in Christ Jesus not to get too deep here but if you know your Bible the word says that Jesus was the Word of God the Word of God was with God the Word of God was God the Word came to earth and became flesh and dwelt among us that's who Jesus is he's the Word of God Colossians says all things were created through him by him and for him so basically every time God said let there be that was Jesus Christ the Word of God um, coming out of God's mouth that is Jesus Christ so when he says that you were created in Jesus Christ everything God ever spoke that's how it was created every word that's ever come out of God's mouth that is Jesus Christ because Jesus before he took on flesh and blood was the Word of God so created in Jesus Christ why why were we even created for good works Let me stop right there because there's a lot of teachings out there that you have to earn your salvation. Ephesians tells us that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. James tells you that I will show you my works because of my faith. I'm, I'm, I'm not working to gain faith. I'm not working to gain my salvation because I'm saved, because I have faith. That's why you're going to see my good work. So let me make that abundantly clear. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot keep and earn your way into heaven. It's either a free gift or it's not. Like I told my brother Casey earlier today, and we'll touch on that here in a minute. Salvation is either a free gift or it's not. But why were we created in Jesus Christ? We were created in Jesus for good works. You masterpiece, you unique individual, you, the people watching right now, the people that are watching on the replay, you as an individual, I'm not talking to the TD Jakeses, I'm not talking to the big name pastors out there, I'm talking to you that's watching now, watching later, whatever, you, you that think that you don't have what it takes, you that think you don't know what your gift and callings are, you that thinks that um, you're just going to keep tithing to the church and it's your pastor's job to do all the ministry, you're who I'm talking to right now, you, you're the masterpiece that the Bible is talking about, okay? Spiritual backflips again, brother. <laughs> Don't land on your head, bro. <laughs> You're who I'm talking to. You're the masterpiece that this Bible is talking about. You're the unique, one-of-a-kind masterpiece, workmanship that the Bible is talking about. You are. Not all the big spiritual big wigs that you see plastered all over your TV. You. You're that person. Why were you created? Why was Jason created? We were created for good works. Okay? We were created for good works. We were created to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We were created to live in such a way that people would know something is different about us and when they would ask why it is the way that we are and how are we the way that we are how do you have joy when you've lost a loved one how do you still have joy whenever you've lost a child how do you still have joy when you've spent so many years in prison and you, you're still in there or you've come out how 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 and that's your opportunity to give your testimony that's your opportunity to testify about the, the the glory of who God is the glory of Jesus Christ why were you created you masterpiece you one of a kind unique masterpiece why were you created for good works okay what good works keep reading which God prepared beforehand which God prepared beforehand you're a masterpiece you're unique you're one of a kind you were thought about from the foundations of the world, when God was thinking about you, he knew everything you would ever do, good and bad, recorded it in his book, and chose to create you anyway. And in that plan that he recorded, there was also a plan to reconcile all the good stuff we did and all the dumb stuff that we've ever done. And in that plan, 
while he's reconciling all that stuff, that plan starts meshing over into your plan. Like here we are right now. We're doing truck church. Y'all are listening to me teach. I'm looking at your comments and seeing the names of people who's watching here. Somewhere along the way, God knew from the foundation of the world that yes, I was going to go to prison, but I was also going to get saved and learn the word and preach and teach. And one day, all these years later, we're going to start this thing called truck church because that was not a surprise to God. The only reason we started truck church was because COVID-19 shut down churches. God knew that COVID was coming. He knew the churches were going to shut down. He knew that he was going to ask me to start this truck church deal. And he knew that everybody that's watching now and later on the replay that we were going to have this conversation. So somewhere along the way, while he's thinking about Jason, all the good and bad things I was ever going to do, including prison, including the whole murder case, he's thinking about it way back then. And way back then, as he's planning to reconcile all the dumb things that I'm ever going to do, he's also planning Joseph Seha's life, and he's planning Anthony Elrod's life, and Chris James, and Don Freeman's, and Royal Chapman. He's planning our lives, and he's seeing how he can intricately weave them together to where we meet one day, to where we do good works together one day, to where we do truck church together one day. He created us all back then under good works. When were the good works established that you're worried about? What do I need to do? Why are you trying to figure it out? Why are you trying to figure it out? Because we just read that the good works that you're called to do were set up from the foundation of the world, the same time frame that he's planning you, what you're going to look like and act like and what your personality is going to be like, what gifts and talents and calling and purpose he's going to give you. Way back then, he's already planning the good works that, that you're going to do. You're his masterpiece, one of a kind, unique masterpiece. You were created in Jesus Christ. Why? For good works. You were created for good works. What good works? The ones that he started thinking about from the foundation of the world. Oh my gosh, how do I find them out? What am I going to do? How do I know if I'm in his will or if I'm not? Let's read the last phrase together and let's just take all the load off of you. That we should walk in them or that we should walk them out. God has done all the heavy lifting. God has done all the hard work. He thought about you from the foundations of the world. He thought about all the good you would ever do, all the bad you would ever do, and he chose to create you anyway and write it in his book before you lived your first day. He began to plan all the good works that you were ever going to do, even if it took you 20, 30, 40, 50 years to get saved. He's already planning the good works. He's already planning the other people that he's going to weave into your life to grow you or for you to grow them. He's already planning those things out. You were created in Jesus Christ. Why? For good works. What good works? The ones that he thought about from the foundations of the world. Why? He's still planning you and thinking about the good and bad things you're going to do. Way back then, he planned the good works. He planned the people that we were going to meet. And what do you do with those things? You walk in them. You just walk them out. He's done all the heavy lifting. What does that mean? It means that ministry is not always behind the pulpit. Matter of fact, it's rarely behind the pulpit. Real, real ministry is not behind the pulpit. Real, what you say? <laughs> Throat punch. Man, you're throwing me off, Joseph. Real ministry is not behind the pulpit. Real ministry is not Jason sitting in front of his phone doing truck church at the lake. That's not real ministry. Real ministry is what we take from what we heard behind the pulpit. Real ministry is what we take from what we've learned at truck church. Real ministry is what we learn at all the church services, all the online services, all the Bible studies we've ever done, all the personal Bible studies that we've ever done. Real ministry is when we take all that stuff and we go put it to use in real life. Real ministry is your trip to Walmart. Real ministry is when you're going to fill up at the gas station. Real ministry is when you're going underneath the, the bridges in Dallas to minister to the homeless people. Real ministry is when you're flying all over the country, going off into these prisons all over the country, and you're just sharing the love of Jesus. We walk into those prisons, and those dudes look so mad, you can't tell if they want to punch you in the throat, beat you up, or just turn it deaf ear. And then by the time it's over with, just a little bit of love with a couple of hours with about 15 or 20 people, we can't get out of there because we're being overwhelmed with handshakes and hugs and just love these guys just love us and they don't want to see us leave and then we come back home and we talk about how awesome we feel and how much they built us up we went there to bless and we ended up getting blessed and then next thing you know give it a couple of weeks and all of a sudden letters start popping up about what it meant about what it meant don i think about this all the time if we didn't fall underneath the vision that god gave you if we didn't get on those planes and go all the um 
all the testimonies that we wouldn't have under our belt, and, and that might be a horrible way of saying it, I don't know how else to say it, all the testimonies that we wouldn't even know about, these letters that are coming in, thank you for coming in. You know what, I was planning on, on getting out and messing up again, but now I wanna be an entrepreneur, I wanna get on my feet, I wanna do right. You know what, I'm gonna try to make my relationship work with my baby mama. You know what, I'm gonna get out there, because we got a girl that goes in there and talks about how hard it was um, because of her father being locked up the whole time. And so the anger that was in her, you've got guys in there like, hey, I've been gone 15 or 20 years. My kid really doesn't know me. So when I get out, I'm not going to go interrupt their life. And after that girl speaks, now these guys are writing us letters saying, I'm going to find a way to write my kids. When I get out, I want to be in my kid's life. I might have missed 20 years, but that doesn't mean I can't jump in now and get started. I think about it all the time. What if we never got on those planes? And it don't have to be a plane. We could have gotten our cars and came to a local prison. What I'm saying is, is all those places we've been, all those lives that we've touched, God had set all that stuff up from the foundation of the world. The, the vision that God gave Don with the Securus Foundation, God set that up from the foundation of the world. We just happen to just now be finding out about it, but God's known about it this whole time. What we're also finding out now is that God knew everything good and bad that we would ever do from the foundation of the world and chose to create us anyway. And at that same time, he chose to set up all these good works. And all we have to do is walk them out. That's all you and I have to do. There's no pressure. There's no work. There's no searching. There's no um, a pet peeve of mine. And please don't let this hurt your feelings. A pet peeve of mine, because people use it as an excuse, I don't know my gift. I don't know my calling yet. I don't know what my, my purpose is. It doesn't upset me that you say that because I know that it's a real thing. I know that's a real thing that people go through. They don't know the bigger picture. They don't know the big calling, the big purpose. They may know a little bit about their um, uh, gifts and talents. They're still trying to figure that out. But Satan will blind them and use that as the reason why they do nothing. So they don't do any type of reaching out. They, they're they looking, for, I call it platform ministry or showing ministry. When people say you're called according to God's purpose, people's minds go to pulpits, um, um, choir boxes, um, podcasts, TV shows, whatever. Well, that's all cool. That's platform ministry. That's showy ministry that everybody gets to see. That's not, that's not real ministry. That's not what God has called us to ultimately. That's, if you're only doing that, I'll use my boy T.D. Jakes because I don't think he would be upset for me saying this about him. If T.D. Jakes only did ministry behind that pulpit, which he's awesome at doing and I watch him all the time, I love him. It would hurt my feelings to know that he was a jerk at a restaurant or a gas station or whatever. If he was not also doing ministry as life happened, it would hurt my heart because I don't feel that from that man. And I'm not picking on him. He's just, he's somebody that I really look up to. So I'm using him as an example. Real ministry is not behind that pulpit. That's where people um, give you credit, give you praise. That's what you do. That's awesome. But that's not real ministry. Real ministry is in the trenches. Real ministry is everyday life. Stuff you've got to walk out. So when people tell me I don't know my gifts, my talent, my, my calling, my purpose, and Satan uses that as their excuse not to do anything, I just want to shake you because I'm like, hey, guess what? This will blow your mind right here. There are things all over the place online where you can do these tests to find out your gifts and talents. Sorry, I'm talking myself dry. Hi, Jason Cole. I'm late, but it's okay. Hey, love you, Lori. There are things all over online where people can go on there and uh, take a test and try to figure out their gifts and talents. I have two problems with that. The first one is responsibility. Don't be a stumbling block. Amen. So the first problem that I have with that is that um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 begins to break down a lot of the spiritual gifts. Well, one of the things that he kicks it off with right away is the spirit dispenses the gifts as he wills. So that doesn't mean that you're gonna have just one gift. It doesn't mean that you're gonna have all of the gifts. What it means is, is whenever God gets ready to drop on you to reach one of his children, he can drop any gift on you he wants to anytime he gets ready to. God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants to. So don't limit yourself, okay? Kathy, good to see you. Cassie, good to see you, babe. Don't limit yourself in the gifts because the Bible says that the spirit dispenses them as he wants to. You could have one gift, you could have 10 gifts, you could have 50 gifts. The point is, when God gets ready to show himself strong through you to somebody else, he'll drop whatever gift on you he wants to in the moment. So don't limit yourself. The other thing is, is these tests are designed basically like personality tests to guide you on what your gifts could possibly be. 
My issue with that is this, you could take those and again, you're gonna limit yourself and put yourself in a box. Well, the test said that I have the gift of mercy and the gift of helps, so that's what I'm gonna do. Well, if God wants to drop a bomb on you to give a word one day, are you not gonna do it because the paper test online told you that you only have the gift of mercy and helps? You've limited yourself and you're gonna miss God. But here, here's the biggest thing that I wanna say um, about the whole gift search and all that. You ready? This is gonna be deep, it's gonna be deep, it's gonna be deep. I don't know my gift, I don't know my calling, I don't know my purpose, okay? You ready? You ready? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your gift is, it doesn't matter what your calling is, it doesn't matter what your purpose is, it doesn't matter if you have one gift, 10 gift, 50 gifts, none of it matters. It does not matter that you find out what your gifts, talents, and purpose are. You know what? All that matters is that you hook up with Jesus and you follow him and you walk with him as closely as you can all the days of your life. Jason, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Because the Bible talks about callings and purposes and gifts and all these things. What do you mean it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter because we just read that God set up all your good works from the foundation of the earth, that you should walk in them, that you should walk them out. If you're walking with Jesus, you're going to run into the good works that you were called to. You're going to run into the good works that were set up for you from the foundation of the world. And there's no pressure. There's no hard work. All you have to do is walk in them, walk them out. You don't have to put the label on the gift to be able to walk them out. Is it cool for you to learn your gifts and calling and purpose? Yes, that's real, that's real cool. But what I'm telling you is at the end of the day, putting a label on whatever your gifts and talents are doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're hooked up with Jesus, you're walking with him, and you're gonna run into those good works that were set up for you from the foundation of the world, and the only job that you have in it is walking them out, walking in them. That's what's important. You're spending all your time trying to figure out the gifts and talents, and Jesus is sitting here waving like, would you just walk? Would you open your eyes? Look, I sent you to Walmart on this day at this time for a specific reason. Keep your eyes open. Hey, you're running out of gas. I knew from the foundation of the world that you were gonna run out of gas on this day, on this time, passing this gas station. Keep your eyes open. I knew that you were gonna go pay the water bill on this day at this time. Keep your eyes open. I know that you work eight to five Monday through Friday. And I gave you a new coworker and they just happened to work in the desk beside yours. Hey, I did that for a reason. Keep your eyes open. Don't wait for Sunday morning. Don't wait for Wednesday night. Keep your eyes open. Something is going to be said. And when it gets said, walk in it. Walk in it. Take advantage of the opportunity. That's ministry right there. You think you're going to work eight to five. What you didn't know is you're getting paid to clock into ministry is what you didn't know. You're already in the ministry and you're getting funded by a business. <laughs> you have full financial support for ministry just by showing up at work. Do you think God's not going to use you at work? He's only going to use you on Sunday morning and Wednesday night? No, you're clocking into ministry and didn't even know it. Everywhere you go, you're getting paid for ministry and didn't even know it. Let me tell you about my day while I'm all juiced up and fired up. So today I got nine million errands I got to run on my day off. Don't like doing that because I want to be at home as much as I can on my day off. But uh, I couldn't get all this stuff done on a one hour lunch break. So today I've got to do all this stuff. I've got to uh, uh, inspect my truck, register my truck, get an old change, uh, get horse feed, and I've got to uh, get a couple of things for the house, okay? <clears throat> so I get up, spend some time with the kids and all that, get my truck, and I head to town. First place I'm gonna stop is I'm gonna do it in logical order is I go to the inspection place. <clears throat> When I got ready to leave the house, I got up, I had a little breakfast, I spent time with the kids, we played, and I'm like, in my mind, listen, listen, man, uh, I hope this makes sense coming out of my mouth the same way that it's making sense in my head while I'm trying to teach it, okay? I'm not paying attention to the time. I did not get up this morning thinking at 10 o'clock sharp, I need to leave and get all these errands ran, come home, and uh, take my daughters out on a uh, daddy-daughter date. Like, I didn't wake up with that. I was just gonna wake up, spend time with the kids, do some breakfast, when the time felt right, leave, okay? I I'm not planning this, but God has been planning this day off from the foundation of the world, okay? God has also been planning good works for me to walk out on this day from the foundation of the world. I'm waking up so happenstance, I'm just gonna chill with the kids, I'm just gonna have breakfast, and then I'll go do my rent, my errands as they come to me. There's not a certain time in my world. There's a certain time in God's world. I go to the inspection place. Didn't seem like a big God moment. I do my inspection thing, and I go to leave. 
I always leave there and get on interstate to go into town. For some reason today, I didn't want to fight the other cars. I didn't want to worry about that. I had all my worship music, so I stayed on the service road. Listen, listen, it was just a feeling to me. I always get on the interstate and then go the three or four miles into town. Always, always. I leave with the feeling of, I don't want to fight the cars. I'm just going to stay on the service road. Drive down the service road, and before I get to my exit, there was a car broke down with the hood up and it's smoking. I see a black gentleman in front of the car, just shaking his head at the car, an older uh, black gentleman shaking his head, rubbing his chin. And so I, I pull up beside him, I roll down the window, I said, are you okay? He goes, man, I think I need some help. And I said, let me, let me get the truck out of the road. So I get the truck out of the road and I get out, and then I find out that he's got a three-year-old and a uh, six-year-old grandbabies in the car with him. I was like, man, what happened? He's like, dude, I'm from Carthage. I'm way away from home. The car messed up and, and I don't know car lingo, I'm not a mechanic. He told me two things that were broke down. I'm like, I already know I can't do anything about it. And I said, so what's the plan? What do we need to do? And he said, man, I'll tell you what. He said, I, I've already called a tow truck, truck driver knowing I don't have all the money for it. He said, I've got most of it, but he's, I mean, he had it down to the penny. He said, I'm $36 and 72 cents short of paying him to get my car from here to Carthage. And he said, I, I know you don't know me and I don't know you. I don't know if you can help me. If you can help me, Give me your name, your address. I will gladly pay you back and then some for helping me out. And I said, so so there's nothing we can do to your car. You're too far away for me to tow it. You've already got a tow truck driver. We really just need to get you 40 bucks, basically. And he says, he's so genuine. He goes, I don't even need 40 bucks. I need $36.72 is all I need. I mean, the dude is just that genuine. I was like, man, there's a gas station right up here. Um, um, get, get the kids in the truck. Let's go, let's go down to the gas station. I'll get you, I'll get you 40 bucks out of the ATM or whatever. So uh, I'm not filthy rich. My pockets aren't loaded. I've had an amazing week in sales. That money doesn't hit till this coming week. I've had two or three slow week in sales. I'm not, I'm not drowning, but I'm not loaded right now either. But I've, but man, I know that I'm supposed to do this. And so um, I tell him, get in the truck, let's go. So we get to the truck, we're having small talk, we're talking and chopping it up and just enjoying conversation. Go to the gas station, he goes into his restroom. God tells me to give him 60 bucks in case he needs food or drinks or something for the kids on the way there. Pull out 60 bucks. And of course, man, I ain't saying none of this stuff to brag. Like if if that's all you're hearing me say, then uh, you're, you're just not even on the same page that I'm on right now. <clears throat> I don't care nothing about people knowing what I do to try to help people. I'm using this for, for conversation and teaching purposes. So we get the 60 bucks, we talk, we get some drinks. We get back in my truck, we go back. I give him the uh, the 60 bucks and I was like, hey man, there's a little bit extra in case you need something for the ride home or whatever. And um, um, I said, do you need me to sit here with you? Do you need anything? He's like, no. He said, they told me that they were like 10 minutes out or whatever. He goes, I'll, I'll be fine, I promise. I said, okay, cool. Had my business card that's got my cell phone number on it. I gave that to him. I'm like, hey, if you, uh, if you need if you need to uh, call me, if they don't show up, I'll be in town running errands. Let me know, we'll figure something out, okay? And he goes, okay, bro. He goes, uh, so he turns my card over and he goes, hey, what's your, what's your address or PO box? He goes, I want to send you, I want to bless you too. And I said, uh, I said, no, bro, that's good. And I said, um, um, I don't want the money. And I said, you know what, bro, you've had a really hard day. And uh, I'm just thankful that you're a part of your grandbaby's, you know, lives and stuff like that. And I said, just let me bless you today. And um, something that I learned from my friend yesterday is saying that, that she says, and I told him, I said, I just, I just want you to be aware that this had nothing to do with me and you. I shouldn't even pass on this road. And I said, um, Jesus sees you, man. Jesus sees you today, and he wants you to know that he loves you. And he's like, he goes, man. He goes, I don't think I've ever had nobody tell me that before. I've never met anybody like that before. He's like, okay. Um, he's so confused. He's like, I still want to give you the money. Give me your address or a P.O. box, and I, I want to send you the money. And I said, no, bro. I said, I'm not going to give you the information, not because I'm scared of you having my info. Uh, I'm not going to give it to you because I don't want the money back. Like, I legit just want to bless you and your family today and tell you that Jesus sees you, man. Your hardest day, you're out here sweating. It's so freaking hot on the side of the road. Your car is down. Jesus sees you, and he loves you, man, and I don't want the money back. And uh, the dude starts crying, man. The dude just broke down crying. And, uh, and so, obviously, I cried, too. So we had a good little cry. We hugged. I asked him if I could pray for him. He let me pray for him. And then I got in the truck and said, hey, you've got my number. If the tow truck driver doesn't show up, call me. We'll figure it out. So I leave there feeling like a million bucks. I'm like, and I think of these two verses already. And I've been thinking all day, God, what am I going to preach on? What am I going to teach on? Whatever. We went really deep the last two weeks. And I don't mind doing that again. But I'm always listening for God's voice. What do you want to teach on? I don't want to fabricate some sermon. What do you want to, what do you want to talk about? And uh, so... Uh, I leave there feeling like a million bucks, and I'm like, I think that's what I'm supposed to talk about today. 
Jesus sees you and he loves you. How simple of a ministry is that? Who can't say that? Jesus loves you and he sees you. Perfect strain. That's, but yeah, Royal, you get, that's ministry. That was ministry right there on the side of the road. It took 15 minutes of my day and changed his whole day. Can you imagine being a stranger? Uh, I don't even know what it is, 100 miles or better away from home. You don't know nobody in this town. You're broke down with two of your grandbabies. And just that moment, he didn't have a credit card on him, didn't have a debt. His wife had all the credit cards, debit cards, everything. Like he, he's literally stranded in a town that he's not from. Can you imagine the moments before we meet where he's sitting there thinking, what in the world am I fixing to do? I got my two grandbabies here. It's hotter than the Dickens in here. I don't have access to, to, to any more money than what I have in my hand. What am I, can you imagine that moment? What am I going to do? And who knew that Jesus was going to show up in a red Dodge Dooley, <laughs> a dude that spent 11 years in prison on a murder case. That guy still don't know that. I never told him that. He did not leave knowing that some guy from prison with a murder case is who helped him out. All he knows is some white dude showed up in a red truck like, hey, homeboy, what's up? You need some help? Let, get in the truck. Let's go. That's all he knows of me. Doesn't even know. Well, I guess he knows that I'm a Christian because I told him, you know, Jesus sees you. But I never told him I'm a Christian. Do you know Jesus? You need to get saved. You could die tonight. You know, I didn't go into all that. Jesus sees you and he loves you. And we had a good cry and he left there thinking whatever it was he was thinking. But I just, when I'm driving to the next place, I'm sitting there thinking, man, from that guy to go to that moment on what am I going to do on the side of the road with my two grandbabies? What in the world am I going to do? I'm in a town that I'm not from. Nobody knows me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And boom, somebody shows up in a red truck. And then, not to get all racial or whatever, but we're dealing with all this Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, all this drama, crazy stuff that's going on in the world, and God sets it up to where there's a black gentleman that's having some issues, and a white dude shows up wanting to help. And nobody had to talk about racism, nobody had to bring up what ethnicity either one of us were. It was just two humans that met because God set it up from the foundation of the world that these two men would, would, would meet and that it was going to be a good work for somebody to walk out just beautiful and I go on to my next one thinking God I think that's what you want me to talk about Jesus sees you and he loves you and so I'm feeling like a million bucks I'm like man God thank you for that moment thank you for I'm, I'm off on this day all week long I was stressing because I'm a dummy sometimes all week long I'm stressing because I'm like when am I gonna get my truck inspected my truck is out of registration when am I gonna do that what if I get pulled over and get a ticket uh, man my old change I'm over on that too I'm just my life is too busy. I don't have time for all this stuff. When am I going to do it? Oh, I'm almost out of horse feed. When am I going to do it? And then finally, finally, I get a day off that I don't have to do a bunch of stuff and I can get it all done at one time. And, all, and God knew all that. God knew all that. He knew the stress during the week of not being able to get all these errands ran. He knew that I was going to get them all done on a Tuesday and he set it up from the foundation of the world. I wasted all that stressful week for nothing. Boom. Have that moment with him. I'm like, gosh, this is awesome. So I drive my next stop. I'm going to go get my truck registered. So I go get registered. They're not letting people in and out without getting interviewed and all this crazy stuff. And there's this long line and it's so hot and everybody's got masks on and you got to get interviewed at the door. And some people get to, some people get to go in and some people don't. And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to be here for a long time. So I get my mask, get my stuff. I go get in line and I'm waiting in line for a long time. And it is really, really hot. And uh, the lady at the door is not being friendly. The people in line are being jerks to the lady at the door, not being friendly. It's just bad, bad, bad. Now there's a bunch of people that are behind me, uh, mostly guys. And then this little old lady shows up. She's probably 80 or 90 years old, barely can walk. And so she, poor girl, gets out of the car. I'm like uh, number two in line now, or number three in line. And um, so uh, the lady comes up. She's like, how long have y'all been waiting? I don't know if I can stand that long. And I said, uh, I said, I've been here about 20 or 30 minutes or whatever, but I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to be next. I said, you're more than welcome to get in front of me. Cause I'm thinking it's a bunch of guys behind me or whatever. You see this older lady, it's a no brainer. Like who in the world wouldn't let this lady have their spot? You know what I'm saying? Who's who, what kind of jerk is going to make this little old lady get back in the line and wait for an hour uh, to pay for her registration? You know what I'm saying? So I was like, ma'am, it, it's hot out here. I don't mind you going in front of me. I can wait five or 10 more minutes. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, she's like, are you sure? I'm like, yes, I'm sure. And I don't even think about the people behind me because I'm like, it's a no brainer. So I let this lady um, uh, get in front of me in line. And as soon as she gets in front of me in line and gets to move forward, as she's taking care of her business, the dudes behind me go to mumbling. They're just like, we've been waiting all this time. He just gonna let somebody else cut in front of him, da da da. And it shot me back to prison. <laughs> just hearing people mumble and all the drama and this and that. And so now I'm getting a little heated because I'm like, 
you're willing to let this little old lady go to the back of the line and wait for an hour when she's 80, 90 years old. And uh, because you've been in line and you're young and healthy, you're gonna let this little old lady go to the back and wait in line. So I turned around, nice and friendly the first time, I turned around and I asked him, I said, hey, um, I didn't think it would be an issue to let this older lady get in front of me because she's older. And I would think any grown man uh, would be okay with her getting in line. I said, so if you're not okay with that, would it make you feel better if I went to the back of the line? You know, trying to uh, not be a jerk that I can be. Would it make you feel better since I let her in front of me? Would it make you feel better if I went to the back of the line? Cause I will, I don't have that much pride that I can't do that. And they're like, no, just whatever. It don't even matter. And I was like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, it don't even matter. I said, okay, cool. So I turn around and I'm, I'm fixing to be next in line. She gets her stuff and she turns around and just taps me on the shoulder and she goes, thank you, young man. Thank you, sweet young man. And I said, hey, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Jesus loves, Jesus sees you and Jesus loves you. Um, have a good day. And she just, no cry, no tear, no drop, dramatic. She just, whatever. I could tell she smiled because of her eyes. Obviously her face is covered up. And she goes and gets her cars and leave. I'm taking care of my business and these dudes go to grumbling again. And then I was not so Christian the second time. I turned around with my best, um, Christian throat punch face that I could come up with and just turn around and gave him that prison mean mug and asked him if we were going to have an issue. And of course, uh, they said they didn't have any issues. They were just upset. So I turned around, paid for my, <laughs> paid for my stuff and got, <laughs> got in my truck and I left. And so, uh, the, the, uh, the feed store is right next to that. So I get my truck and I go to the feed store and, uh, I walk in, there's a lady at the counter that I had n never seen before in my life. And all I need is a few bags of feed and then to get out of there. So uh, I go into the feed store. There's a lady that's there I've never seen before. A real young girl, probably uh, 18 to 20, I'm guessing, really don't know. And she goes, hey, I've got to go take care of somebody outside. I'm the only one here. I'll be back, back, I promise. I'm sorry. I was like, no, it's good. I'm not in no rush. So she leaves. She goes out. She comes back in. I'm kind of looking at the store. And, man, she is just, she's eyeballing me. Not in a weird way, but just like, like trying to figure me out, right? Just trying to figure me out. And so, so I look at her, like I'm trying to figure out if I know her, like, is this somebody, do we know mutual people? And you know, what's the deal, whatever. And she just keeps looking, keeps looking, keeps looking. <laughs> and so I ask her, I was like, do I know you? And she's like, no, I don't think so. And she thinks a minute, thinks a minute, thinks a minute. And then her eyes get real big and she goes, are, are you, are you, are you the guy from drug church? <laughs> and I just died laughing because I've heard that a few times in, in town over the last few weeks. Um, people recognize the face and there's people all over my town share this thankfully so it it gets in front of a lot of people but this young girl who I've never seen before says um, are you the guy from church church and I said <laughs> I said yes I'm the guy from I'm the guy from church church and she goes oh my gosh I love that never met her in my life don't know her name none of that and she's like oh my gosh I love the way that you teach I love the way that you break it down like I can totally understand the way you break down the Bible like thank you for what you do and then I, she goes, I don't know all of your story, but I've caught pieces of it from watching your truck churches. You know, you did time and stuff like that. She goes, I just want to tell you how much it's inspired me because she said, uh, I know I'm young, but she's like, I've been a severe alcoholic uh, most of my life. And she said, COVID hit. And she said, I just got sober back in February, but I'm so proud of myself. And there's so much negativity in the world and from my family and from uh, Facebook and stuff like that. She's like, but I haven't had a drink, which is big for me. I've been an alcoholic for a long time and I haven't had a drink since February. And she goes, man, when I watch your story, it's so inspiring to me. One, I learn from you. I love the way you break it down, teach it. I can understand the way you teach, but just knowing that you come from prison and you're doing good stuff with your life, she goes, you have no idea how much hope and inspiration that it gives me. And she said, I just want to say thank you. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I said, uh, I've got to go get you something. So I had like two more books left. I got to order some more. I had two more books, uh, one's for Alicia and then, um, I was like, I want to go get you something. So I go get a book, I sign it, I bring it in there, and I give it to her. And I was like, hey, what is your name? Her name is Raina, R-A-I-N-A, Raina. And her last name is uh, uh, Gan, G-A-N-N. -N. And, and so I don't know that then. I was like, hey, what is your name? So she moves her hair, and she's like, it's Raina, Raina again. And she goes, so that's what people call me all the time, Rain again, like it's going to rain again. And boom, I just get hit with like, you know, this... Uh, spiritual intuition or whatever you want to call it you know the latter rain it's going to rain again god's going to pour out his spirit on the young and old and the young people are going to see dreams and visions and and just all this stuff and i'm just like rain again and that's my favorite worship song is let it rain and i'm just like this girl blessed me so much just because i'm there to buy five bags of horse feed and she goes to tell me i'm a recovering alcoholic i've been sober since february and you've really blessed me and we've never even met 
and I was just like, man, this day is insane. Like, this is awesome. And so uh, we had this amazing moment. And, uh, and I'm thinking about these verses again. I'm like, man, just back to back to back. I'm like, all these good works, God knew everything we would ever do, good or bad, before he ever creates us, and he took the time to record them in his book. And then Ephesians tell us that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, that you should walk them out. Uh, matter of fact, those good works were created beforehand uh, from the foundation of the world that you should walk them out. And I'm thinking, God, the same time that you're thinking about me, you're thinking about all the good and bad stuff I'm ever going to do. You choose to create me anyway. You choose to create this plan that's going to reconcile all the mess uh, that I'm ever going to. Oh, Kitty, you know her. Okay. So uh, you choose to uh, uh, create a plan to reconcile all this mess that I'm going to make in my life. And not only that, but you're going to start weaving other people into my life to build me up and for me to build them up. And at the same time, you're setting up good works from the foundation of the world and all I've got to do in life is walk them out. Like how easy is ministry really? How easy is ministry really? You open your eyes in everyday life. When you're at work, when you're at the grocery store, when you're at the gas station, when you're, when you're wherever. Ministry is everyday life. It's not behind the pulpit. It's not on Facebook Live. Real ministry is everyday life. And it's all been set up from the foundation of the world. All you got to do is show up and walk them out. That's so awesome. I've known Raina for years. I was blown away by her. She uh, is awesome. Um, hopefully I get to see her again. But she really blessed me just with a small bit of story that she, she had. Like she, she blessed me. Hopefully I bless her. Uh, just really cool. Really, really cool. And so um, anyway, so I leave there and um, have to go get my old change. So I go to the old change place. I'm like, hey, I need old change. I'm just going to sit here and chill. And they're like, okay, cool. So we're having small talk. They all know me. I know all those guys there from doing business with them. We chop it up, talk. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit down, get on my phone. I uh, might do some work. And I did. I, I uh, was doing some work on my phone. I was able to sit in the old change place and sell uh, one trader. And I got another guy coming tomorrow. So possibly two traders just sitting there doing my old change. I'm like, that's cool, God. It's my day off. And you're still letting me be successful at work or whatever. Well, then a friend messaged me. And, uh, and this will be a little bit more picky, a little bit harder to, uh, to swallow, but, um, you know me, we're going to go there anyway, Mr. Controversial here. We got to talk about it. So a friend messages me, I'm going to do his wedding in a few months. And he goes, Hey bro, I'm talking to a friend of mine. Um, talking to a friend of mine and, uh, she's not saved. She started posting some questions and I just feel kind of stuck. So I'm going to send you some screenshots and see what you think. So I was like, okay. So he sends me some screenshots and they're friends. And she basically says, uh, hopefully I don't get this wrong. She's like, how can you believe in a God that allows us to live in this world to where Hollywood has become known pedophiles and nothing is going to happen to them. And all these children are being sex trafficked, uh, killed, molested stuff like that. How can you believe in this God that allows all this stuff to go on? Okay. So let me couple that with a conversation that I had prior to that. I had another friend that called me or, or started messaging me saying, Hey, I've got a Christian friend that's really beating me up right now. And I don't know what to do with it. I said, okay, what's the issue? She's like, I was uh, married once before it didn't work out. It wasn't a good marriage. I divorced. I met my new husband who's never been married before. We got married years ago and we're super happy. We're best friends. We've been married for, you know, 20, 30 years or whatever. And it's just great. And she goes, but I've got this Christian friend that's blowing my phone up about how wrong I am, how I'm living in sin. And, uh, I need to find out a way to reconcile it and fix it and all that. And I was like, okay. And before I can respond, she says, somebody else told us that years ago. And so we both repented. We repented to each other. We repented to God. Hey, if we're wrong because I divorced and then remarried, and uh, the Bible says if you get a divorce, you should stay single and all, all this stuff. And uh, she's like, Jason, what do, we, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? Are we really that wrong? And so I have to have a conversation with her about, one, the cool thing is, is right or wrong, you already repented to God, you repented to each other. And I said, but here's the, here's the thing about us Christians. Um, we like to categorize things and we like to have levels of, of sin. And I said, what your friend doesn't realize is that um, there's not sin and then this other category of uh, divorce and remarriage and all that, okay? Sin covers all that. You have sin. People getting divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and all that other legalistic stuff that you want to get into, however deep you want to get into that, 
that stuff that we're trying to talk about, that's still sin too. That sin there is still the same stuff over here as, as your little white lies and uh, whatever it is. Sin is sin. So in God's eyes, sin is sin. In man's eyes, you've got categories of sin. And if you do these up here, you're real bad people. If you do these down here, it's not that big a deal because everybody does those. And so I was explaining that to her about sin has been paid for. People are not going to go to hell because of sin. The Bible says very clearly that Jesus paid once and for all, all sin, all mankind. The sin issue has been taken care of as far as the payment for it, okay? Man, boy, Chris, say that again. Religious people weaponize the Word of God. Absolutely. The Bible's very clear. All sin, all sin, past, present, the sin that has, hasn't even happened yet, all sin was paid for in full at the cross. People will no longer, after the death of Jesus on the cross, people are no longer going to go to hell because of sin, okay? If they, a liar is the same as a thief, which is the same as a child molester. Oh, Sherry Lynn, you must already know where I'm going, girlfriend. Um, so hang on to that thought because you and I are going to make some people mad with this one. So um, all sin was paid for on the cross, past, present, and future. People are no longer going to go to hell because of sin. People are going to go to hell for rejecting the payment, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. People will go to hell for rejecting the payment for sin. They're not going to go to hell because they sinned. They're going to go to hell because they refuse to receive the gift of salvation that paid for sin. The Bible's very crystal clear. Sin was paid for. You're not going to hell because you sin or you have a sin nature. You're going to go to hell because you refuse to receive the free gift of salvation that paid for sin, okay? So, that took care of the lady that was dealing with the uh, Christian friend that was driving her crazy with the whole marriage thing. Now my friend is messaging. He has a friend that is so mad and how can you believe in a God that lets these Hollywood people that are pedophiles, they're still making it, nothing's happening to them. Kids are being sex trafficked, kids are being killed, kids are being molested. And let me do my little uh, side note here. I'm not an advocate for sex trafficking. I'm not an advocate for I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't promote abuse of children or sexual assault or molestation. I'm not for that stuff. That makes me just as mad as it makes anybody else. But we're not, we're not sitting here um, trying to pump each other up about how mad we should be and what should happen to a sex offender or something. That's not the point of this. We're, we're in ministry mode right now. We're, we're teaching. I don't like uh, a, a sexual assaults. I don't like child molestation. I don't like that stuff any more than you do, okay? So I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is let's get on the playing field of where God is and where he sees us. Because our comment is, Hollywood is full of pedophiles. Nothing's happening to them, but we got kids that are dead in the streets and all that stuff, okay? How can you believe in a God that allows that stuff to go on? Jesus said, go and sin no more. The cross isn't a pass. Yeah, nobody uh, said that. Uh, the, the cross is not a pass to sin. I didn't say that. Um, it's absolutely not. He does say go and sin no more. The point is people are not going to go to hell for sinning. They're going to go to hell for rejecting that gift of salvation. If somebody truly accepts that gift of salvation, they will be convicted by sin and not want to sin anymore. So, yes, you're right. Um, he did say go and sin no more. So her problem is, is how can you believe in a God that would allow pedophiles to live? Basically, here was the gist of what she said. She said... Um, that all pedophiles or whatever should basically just die in the street. And so I feel the girl's pain. I know what she's talking about. Like it's a horrible thing what's going through. But I was I was torn in the middle of having this conversation because I'm talking to my buddy because he's like, how do I respond? Like I want to reach out to her love. In love, I want to help her understand. I don't want her to be turned off by God and things like that. And I was like, man, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be very tricky because uh, that that's a very... Uh, Whew, that's just a very touchy subject, period. Just just saying that name, you know, pedophile or sexual uh, assault or anything like that, I don't care if you're super saved or if you're lost. It just starts stirring up anger before anybody even knows what happened or didn't happen. It's a very hard subject to talk about, and that happens to be the one that, she, that she's hung up on. Like, how do I believe in a God that allows these people to make it? And I'm like, bro, the hardest thing that's going to be is to help her understand that God doesn't cat categorize sin. He hates it just as much as we do, but God doesn't put um, pedophiles on a lower level of humanity than he does, you know, this other. Uh, you're, you're, the hardest thing is going to help this girl understand is that your little white lies and pedophilia, murder, um, whatever you want to fill in the blank, uh, 
sin is sin and God died for all of it and it doesn't make it right for anybody's sin. No, nobody's sin is gonna be right, but you're doing categories. And I said, what her heart needs to understand is that your little white lie is guilty of death just as much as what the pedophile did to a child. Not, not what I feel, not what I think, uh, not what the next person feels or thinks. We were all born with the sin nature. All of us were born with the sin nature. All of us deserve death, okay? Absolutely everybody that's ever taken a breath of air has deserved death before you did this whole laundry list of uh, sinful things, okay? Everybody deserved death. The Bible says that very clearly. No one is just, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For one man, Christ died for all once. Christ died once for all. What's hard is getting somebody to understand is that your little white lying habit that you have is just as guilty and deserving as death as the murderer, as the pedophile, as the whatever. That's hard to wrap your mind around as a believer. Can you imagine trying to help a non-believer who is struggling to even believe in God right now? Can you imagine trying to help uh, if anyone causes yes that's a good scripture can you imagine trying to help somebody that's struggling to even believe in God understand that God's got to come into that equation me and you are never going to convince a non-believer that God is love or God is just or whatever you're not going to convince them of that by just speaking like hey sin is sin like that's not going to convince them and that's what I was trying to tell my buddy I'm trying to give him advice you've got to come into her in love but you've got to understand this if Christ is not at work in this conversation if Christ is not breaking her heart down and softening her heart you saying sin is sin is not going to be the thing that's like oh you know what okay that makes sense I think I'll believe in God now uh, bro more than anything than trying to explain all these hard things in life is you need to be praying for her heart you need to be praying that God would reach out and touch her because this is one of the most touchy subjects on the planet and um, anyway what, what's crazy is is I was wondering how good I was doing with my buddy because I wanted to guide him well and I didn't want to set him up for failure or or to cause this girl to get even uh, more mad and and part of her argument was also again how can you believe in a God that thinks that this sin is not worse than this one like I just don't even understand but what was crazy is is I don't know what happened to her and I don't know how it went between them and uh, she's on my heart I don't know if I'm gonna reach out to her I know I'm gonna be praying for her for sure I don't know if uh, he wants to get a message going between all three of us. I don't know what's going to happen, but man, I'm hearing her heart and I'm hearing her hurt. And um, it really touched me. Like I want to reach out to this person, not to resolve, not to resolve that one issue. Like I want to find out like what else is going on in her, her heart. Cause there's a really good chance for her to be this angry about the whole situation. You and I, if you've been in ministry very long, there's probably a very, very high chance um, that some some kind of sexual assault has happened to this woman too and that's where the anger is coming from and she needs to be healed from that right so the issue is not trying to get her on our side or believe that sin is sin and it's equal the issue is way deeper and bigger than that to me the issue is we need to we need to minister to this girl's heart right the other stuff Jesus will help her understand so I was wondering like man okay how'd that conversation go I'm not real sure anyway by the time it was over with my homeboy that I was trying to give him counsel into help, how to help it, help this other girl. He's the one who messaged me. He's like, dude, I reached out to you to help this girl because you ended up helping me. Like you slapped me in the face with some of the stuff that you were saying. Like he goes, I, I categorize sin and I think this one's good and that one's bad. And, um, and he goes, you, you really helped me and really helped open up my eyes. And I'm just like, there we go again. God doesn't waste anything. The, the good work that he set up from the foundation of the world was for me to be at the, uh, the uh, old change place at the right time to sit down to have about 30 minutes to message back and forth on messenger god set that up just like he set um the girl at the feed store up just like he set the older lady up at the uh the registration office just like he set up the gentleman on the side of the road that i ran into he, he set all these good work all i'm doing is running errands today it's my day off and i'm running errands and i'm running into god everywhere that i go got done with that get a couple things at Walmart to go home spend a little bit of time at home and I decided to take my girls out for a daddy daughter date or, or um, we took them I took them to get snow cones and while we're at the snow cone place this young girl 
uh, uh, Kate, she's, uh, I don't know, she's 10 to 12 years old or whatever, but we go to church with her and me and her horseplay and she, she's friends with my girls and her older brothers I'm cool with and just a, a really beautiful family that she even comes from. But uh, we were there ordering and she pulled, her mom pulls up with her to let her hop out and order one over. So we hug, we say hello, we're, I'm messing with her and uh, uh, just picking on her like I always do. She picks on me back or whatever and she's there to get a snow cone and I was like, hey, what are you getting? So she tells me and I get it, I order her hers and I pay for it. She's like, you didn't have to do that. I've got money. Mom gave me money or whatever. I said, I don't care about your money. Like, I don't care about your money. Like, I just, I love you. Uh, I'm invested in you because you're somebody that goes to our church. Uh, Jesus sees you and Jesus loves you too. And I just want you to know that I love you too. And it, again, it wasn't nothing dramatic or anything. Nobody was crying and all that. And then we, she gets her snow cone. We hug, we leave, take my girls to the, uh, the lake right here. I brought them here where I do truck church, spent some time with them. Then go home. They went to vacation Bible study. I came here to get ready for truck church. But that was my day. That was my day in a nutshell. And so just all day long, again, not bringing any of this stuff up to try to say, oh, look what I do. And look at the, I don't care about all that. What I care about is it, it was just a good analogy in my own mind, a good reminder to shoot me back to Psalms 139 verse 16. God knew everything that you would ever do before you lived your first day, good or bad, and chose to create you anyway. How can you logically be a disappointment to somebody that knew everything you were ever going to do, good and bad, and chose to create you anyway? Boom, Ephesians chapter 2, 10. You're his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works that were set up from the foundation of the world that you should walk them out, that you should walk in them. And all day long has been all these things, all these things, all these things. The guy on the side of the road, had no idea that I had went to prison on a murder case. When we met or when we left, the lady at the registration office that I let cut in line had no idea that I was a guy that had been to prison on a murder case. They didn't care. Because I was in prison so long and met so many prison buddies, I know lots of people that have sexual crimes in their past, that have gotten saved, that have changed their lives, that have done amazing things. I've watched guys with murder cases get up and preach a house down and see people get saved and leave gangs and all these amazing things. I've seen guys that have sex cases that have done uh, a worship service where God falls in that place and everybody's on their face. I've seen guys that have had sex cases that have laid hands on people that couldn't walk and then they get up and walk. I've seen guys that have had sex cases that have prayed the Holy Spirit into a room to where nobody could stand themselves anymore. I've seen guys that were thieves, robbers, rapists, do all types of different ministries where God showed up. If we're gonna categorize sin, Pedophiles is one thing. Sex cases is one thing. Murder cases is one thing. Little white lies, ah, we all do that. I wondered if the guy on the side of the road cared that I had a murder case. I wonder if the lady that got healed and was able to walk, if she cared that the person that prayed over her and God used to heal, I wonder if she even cared that the person that prayed over her had a sexual crime in their past. The answer is no to all this. God's going to do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it, through whoever he wants to do it through. While we feel like we get a say-so in it and we get to judge who does what, does not do what, who has the right to do this, do that, who has the right to change their life, who does not have the right to change their life, where we get that, I don't know. Because one day we're all going to stand before God and we're going to give account for everything that we did good and everything that we did bad. And that day is not a heaven or hell day. That is a that is the day to where whenever you everything that you did uh, for the wrong intentions is going to burn up in smoke, not count for nothing. And all the stuff that you did out of a pure heart and good intentions, those things will be turned into gifts, crowns, and you're going to throw those at Jesus' feet. But it's gonna there's going to be what's the word? It's gonna be an eye-opening day. It's gonna be a very eye-opening day. 
because I think about some of the kids that I've reached out to, some of the suicides that I've got to stop, some of the really cool things that I've got to do. Some of those people know who I am. They know my background. They know what I went to prison for. The majority of them don't because it just doesn't happen to come up in that conversation. But I guess for me, I guess I would not want to limit myself on where my help from God is going to come from. I wonder how many people have helped me over the years that I never knew their name. I never knew who they were. never knew where they come from. I wonder what their backgrounds were. And I wonder if one day when we're standing before God and he's kind of like, if we get to, you know, watch a replay of our life or whatever and God's showing us, hey, here's where I was trying to get your attention. Hey, here's where I was trying to bless you and you passed it up and you missed it. Hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. I just wonder if there's going to be a moment to where all things are known because it says we have the mind of Christ now. When we get to heaven, I would imagine we're really going to have the mind of Christ and know this stuff. And I just wonder how eye-opening that's going to be to where we're going to see that the things that we uh, gripe about, get offended about, pick a stance on, stand on the sidelines screaming and protesting whatever we're screaming I, I wonder whenever that day comes um, Jesus chose the least the last and the lost for his ministry yeah that's good Leslie that's good preaching right there um, he absolutely did he picked the ones that everybody else gave up on he picked the ones that um, everybody else says you don't have what it takes you don't make the cut uh, we can't do anything with you and Jesus comes along and says you're perfect you're exactly what I'm looking for let's get to work and um, I just think it's going to be a very eye-opening day. All the, all the things that we wasted, our time, our emotions, our feelings, um, our voices, all the things that we wasted our time uh, picking stances on and, and protesting and all that. Um, and I think we're just going to be at the end of that moment, at the end of the time, we're going to be thinking, wow, God, you really do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, um, through whoever you choose to do it through. And I think there's going to be a conversation that's going to go something like, um, Jason, I told you in my word that I knew everything that you would ever do, good and bad. And I recorded it in my book, and I chose to create you anyway. And while I was doing that, I prepared a whole bunch of good works at that same time before the foundation of the world. And I did all the hard work. I did all the heavy lifting. And all that I ever asked you to do was show up and walk it out. I set it up. I set up the people. I set up the places. I set up the time. I set up the good work. All I ever asked you to do is in your daily life, after you got saved, after you received me as your Savior and allowed me into your heart, and I just wanted to walk with you, I set everything up. And all I've ever asked you to do was just walk in them. Walk them out. It's all been set up. I've done all the heavy lifting. I've done all the hard work. I'm thankful for the ones that I'm aware of. And I know God's not going to beat us up with it at that time. But uh, I just wonder if there's going to be a, a moment of heads hanging whenever you see all the times that it was a simple walk out this good uh, work that, that we, we missed it. We passed it up for whatever excuse that we, that we had or whatever. So anyway, today was very... Uh, humbling today was very uh joyful today was very awesome for me to have whatever it was three four five six god moments of good works and every one of them so god basically was spent all day long today getting me ready for truck church he gave me four or five examples to boom i knew this from the foundation of the world boom this good work was set up from the foundation of the world boom what you did on that murder case didn't have nothing to do with you pulling over and helping this guy on the side of the road did it and you spent all those years wondering about how um, what was going to happen if you ever did get out of prison and what kind of quality of life were you going to have when you got out of prison and you were worried that you spent all that time worried about that and here you just helped a man and his two grandbabies get where they needed to go and they had no idea that you went to prison on a murder case and hey here's this person here's this older lady right here and you saved her from a heat stroke just by letting her cut in line and, and your prison case didn't matter so much anymore did it hey would you trust me one time that's what I hear God screaming all day today would you just trust me one time I know what I'm doing I, I know y'all are down there trying to figure me out trying to put me in a box I know what I'm doing I knew everything nothing takes me by surprise I knew everything all of y'all would ever do good and bad before you lived your first day and I recorded it and I started mapping out good works way back then too and all I've ever asked any of y'all to do is stop questioning me so much just show up and walk it out I've done all the heavy lifting I've done all the hard work I created you for myself for good works and I set them up all I need you to do is walk it out. And ministry today was summed up into two phrases. 
while I'm meeting people in their hard time, in their hard space, whatever. Jesus sees you and Jesus loves you. So do I. And God does what he does with that, man. Blows my mind. So I guess my encouragement for those who don't know, and, and I had a whole other thing I wanted to go get off into, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not necessary. God's telling me we we got the point across that we needed to, but there was another uh, passage or message in there. We'll do that another time or whatever. But um, to those who don't know their gifts, their calling, their purpose, and you're really stressed out about it, you're really worried about it, you're kind of hesitating. Um, I'm hoping this helped you today somehow, some way. To not focus so much on waiting for all that to be relived, uh, revealed. What is my calling? What is my purpose? What are my gifts? What are my talents? I got to know. I got to know. I got to know. Those things will reveal themselves. It's not that important that you know all of them because once you know them, you're going to put yourself in a box and think that God is only going to use you in those ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, the Holy Spirit dispenses the gifts as he wills. However he wants to use you, in a moment, he can drop that gift on you in that moment, and you may never use that gift ever, ever, ever again. God told me specifically one time to lay hands on this dude, a, a volunteer of ours that had cancer. He had brain cancer. God specifically told me to go over there and lay hands on him and pray for his healing in front of the whole class while we're in prison. And my heart's beating a thousand beats a second because, one, I've never done that. My brain is, I'm still a young Christian. My brain is driving me nuts. What if I go up there and I lay hands on him and nothing happens? Everybody's going to think I'm fake and whatever. I'm going through all this stuff and my heart's just beating a million miles an hour to where I just, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I can do this. Where I literally felt like I was going to drop dead if I didn't go do it. I went over there, prayed, prayed over him. I felt the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know if anything was happening. I didn't know if it was my emotions or whatever. We did what we did. It was bad. It was up in the stages, brain cancer six months to live, yada, 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 all that stuff. Go back to my chair and I'm just like, oh gosh, I just prayed for this guy and I'm sitting in my chair still worried about is God going to heal him or if people are going to think I'm fake. You see how I'm just worried about the wrong thing? It should not matter to me if God heals him or not. God told me to do it. I went and I did it. And you know what? The next week when we went back to the faith-based dorm, that dude gave a praise report and went to get checked out. The, the brain cancer was so bad, the roots were all the way in his brain coming out to where they were starting to go into his the, the bone structure of his skull. And uh, the dude comes back the next week and said he went for his checkup. He came back and they could find known cancer. Th there, were, there were roots in his brain and in his skull. I mean, we are infested with cancer, brain cancer. And from one week to the next, he comes back and they could not find any uh, uh, any cancer whatsoever in his mind. Matter of fact, the doctor said it must have been a mistake. We don't know what's going on, whatever. But he had cancer for a long time. Just didn't tell nobody until it got really bad. What's the point in bringing that up? I won't sit here and tell you that I operate in the gift of healing. It's happened to me three or four times. God specifically said, go lay hands, pray, whatever. And God healed him. I don't run around like a chicken with my head cut off praying over everybody waiting on them to get healed part of it might be because i don't have the faith for it but really god hasn't told me to do that so i don't what i'm telling you is is that um, i don't confess i've got the gift of healing just because it happened before in that moment god told me to go do it i did it he dropped that gift on me they got healed okay i know that i have the gift to preach and teach why because i do it all the time and every time i do it if i'm feeling good and feel like i got a good word god shows up the days that I wake up feeling like I've got nothing to offer, nothing to say, nothing to share, nothing's going to help anybody. Man, I'm just as jacked up as everybody else. What in the world am I going to teach them? Boom, God still shows up. I know that I have the gift to preach and teach because God shows up no matter what every single time. Those are the gifts that I operate in a lot. I've operated in, in other gifts. What I'm telling you is, is I've laid hands on somebody before and they got healed. That does not happen to me every day. I don't do that all the time, so I don't run around telling people, I got the gift of healing. God does what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to, through whoever he wants to. 1 Corinthians 12, he dispenses the gifts as he desires. The, the point is, I know I rabbit trail a little bit, but I'm trying to paint a big picture. Don't spend so much time worried about what your specific gifts, talents, calling, and purpose is because all the good works that you were ever called to walk out were set up from the foundations of the world. Uh, where in Corinthians were you saying, I want to read it and didn't catch it? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 breaks down the gifts. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13 basically says, it doesn't matter what gifts you have, if you don't operate in love, you're just a bunch of noise anyway, and you're wasting your time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about order. If you don't operate in your gifts in order, you're out of line still. So 1 Corinthians 12 is the gifts. Chapter 13 is if you don't operate in love, you're wasting your time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is if you don't operate in order, you're wasting your time and you're causing a bunch of chaos. That's how 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 are set up. Um, so it doesn't matter what your gifts, what your calling, talents, all that. It does not matter that you figure them out specifically because one, you're going to put yourself in a box and think that's the only way God's going to use you, and that's not true. God's going to dispense the gifts as he wants to whenever he needs to. And number two, it doesn't matter because all the good works that you were ever, ever, ever going to ever walk out were set up from the foundation of the world and recorded in his book, and all you have to do is show up, walk in them, walk them out. So yes, like Sherry just said, how did you word it, Sherry? Um, divine appointments all day, every day. Absolutely. If you will walk around with your eyes open, I went to the inspection place at a specific time so that when I left there, I would meet that guy 10 minutes before the tow truck driver got there knowing he was $40 short. He called the tow truck driver knowing he didn't have the money for it. Okay? The tow truck driver was going to be there in 10 minutes. If, if I would have went earlier, I would have missed him. If I went later, I would have missed him. Okay? I left there, specifically went straight to the registration place. If I would have got there beforehand or afterhand, I wouldn't have been the guy next in line that would allow that older lady to get in line so she doesn't have a stinking heat stroke, okay? If I didn't get to the old place at this specific time, I wouldn't have been free to have that conversation with my buddy that was trying to reach out to his friend. My day in my world was so happenstance coincidental. I'm just... When I get this one done, I'm going here. When that one gets done, I'm going here. God's like, no, 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 this is very specific. I'm gonna make sure you get done here at this time so that your butt is here at this time because I've got another good work waiting on you. And I'm gonna make sure that one gets wrapped up and you go here because I've got another specific one go waiting on you again all day long. It, you might wake up thinking that it's just nothing's going on, nothing's planned or whatever, but I'm telling you, man, your day has been planned from the foundation of the world and your job is just to show up, walk in it, and walk it out. That blows my mind. I have preached this sermon three or four different times, three or four different ways, but it keeps coming up to me. So when it comes up to me, I'm going to bring it out. I woke up this morning praying about what are we going to talk about at Truck Church. I don't know what I want to hit on. God, what do you want to hit on? I didn't get the answer. I just went throughout my day and then boom, God moment, God moment, God moment, go moment. Okay, God, I got you. I got you. That's what you want to talk about. We could have talked about how God orders your steps. There's a million scriptures on that. We could have talked about how he orders your ways. Uh, there's so many ways to hit on this. But the point of it is, quit tripping on what you don't know. When you think of your ministry or what ministry is like, matter of fact, um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 or 10, 5, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, right after it says, uh, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. Goes on, goes on, goes on. Then it says, and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. It didn't say certain people. It didn't say uh, 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 very few people. It said we, Christians, believers, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? To return something uh, in, in, into the order that it was previously. We were one with God. Sin nature happens. We became separated from God. Okay? Reconciliation is what we do to bring people back into relationship with God. All Christians, all saved people have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. You bring your, you're reconciling, bringing people back to God. That's what we're doing. How do you do that? Those good works that have been set up for your life and my life from the foundation of the world. Uh, 2 Corinthians. Oh, 2 Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I think 17 is where it says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. Uh, probably when you get down somewhere between 19 and verse 21, it starts talking about uh, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That goes to all Christians, not preachers, not teachers, not uh, choir members, not the people that just have the gift of mercy and help. No, all Christians have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Your everyday life has got divine appointments that were set up from the foundation of the world and all you have to do is walk them out. So if you're walking around with your eyes open looking for God moments, your daily errands are gonna be full of moments. And, and I just, I happen to have four or five today. Sometimes it might be one, whatever. 
it doesn't matter how many. The point is, like, I want to I want to miss as least as possible. I just happen to have a bunch today, but that's because God was preparing me for truck church. He made sure I had a like a God filled day, so I'd have enough uh, material to be able to present uh, what God had put in my heart today. We all have been given the ministry of reconciliation. How are you going to reconcile back to God? You're going to walk out the um, the good works that God has set up for your life from the foundation of the world. You're going to walk them out. So let's wrap it up one last time with what we're even talking about. Psalms chapter 139, verse 16. And I promise you this was just supposed to be the foundation. I wanted to go to Luke chapter 7, but uh, we'll get there another time. Um, God does what he wants to do. Uh, they are not coincidences. They are God incidences. That's awesome. And I can't I even hardly say that word, Dan. <laughs> Psalms 139, 16. God knew everything you would ever do, good and bad, before you lived your first day, recorded in his book. At that same time, Ephesians chapter 2, 10 is going on. You're his workmanship, one of a kind, unique masterpiece, created in Jesus Christ, four good works that were set up from the foundation of the world that you should walk in them. Walk them out. So while we're sitting here feeling like a disappointment, we have nothing to offer. God is saying, I knew everything good and bad that you would ever do before you lived your first day, recorded in my book, and chose to go ahead and map out all these God appointments, these divine appointments, these good works for you to walk them out. All you have to do is show up. God's only asking you to show up and walk them out. He's done all the heavy lifting. He's done all the hard work. He's got everything set up. All he needs is you and your mouth. Jesus sees you. Jesus loves you, and so do I. If it goes anywhere past that, just go with it. If that's all that needs to be said, that's all that needs to be said. Some plant, some water, and some harvest. It's not your job to figure out which one you are because you're going to be one of those three, all different three at different times. You're never going to be the one that only plants. You're never going to be the one that only waters. You're not going to be the one that only harvests. You're going to do those three different things at different times throughout your life. And you will know which one you are in the moment that you're walking it out. Okay? So anyway, I could ramble all day. I'm just excited. It was just a cool day. Just, I'm very humbled. Um, just, it's just, it's just cool, man. God's just cool. Because I'm the guy that thought life was over at 21 years old. And I had no idea that I would have days like this in my future. At 21 years old, life was over. Probably going to get the death penalty or life sentence. God blessing me with a 12-year sentence. I'm going to come home. That didn't even make me happy. Okay, I'm going to come home. But what kind of quality of life am I going to have? What church am I going to go to? Who's going to want to be around me? I mean, just I mean, just a sad case of just bleh. Um, never thought, never dreamed at 21 years old that life would be uh, this rich, you know. So anyway, God's cool. I hope that helps somebody. I hope that encourages somebody. I hope it changes the way that you view your day tomorrow, that you will walk through life knowing, anticipating, expecting. You're not going to show up anywhere at a time that was not predestined and there won't be any people that are in your vicinity that weren't set up to be there from the foundation of the world for you to run into for you to rub shoulders with you're, you're never i want you to leave here with this I, you're never going to find yourself in a place ever again in your life where you weren't supposed to be at that time surrounded by all the other people that god wanted there at that same time for you to run into nowhere nowhere work walmart the gas station the park the lake the the, the electric company the water company no, nowhere you're never going to find yourself again in a place that was not predestined for you to be there at that time surrounded by people that weren't also supposed to be there at that same time okay walk through life like that you're never going to find yourself in a place that you're not supposed to be at that specific time, surrounded by other people that are predestined to be there at that same time just to run into you. Show up and walk it out. God, we love you so much. Thank you for um, the praise reports, the encouragement, the word that we went through. Uh, thank you for the hard stuff that we talked about. I know that's going to create discussion, and I pray that nobody gets ugly uh, in the comments. It uh, doesn't matter if they get ugly with me. I'm used to it. I can handle it. Uh, but with each other, we're all going to have thoughts. We're all going to have uh, comments. And I pray that we would be very Christian 
about our responses and uh, not pushy. So that's my counsel to everybody that's watching now and later. Um, if somebody says something you don't agree with, let me address it because um, I don't want anything to turn into anything ugly. I enjoy reading the comments. I hope the comments are helpful to other people. So God help us to be considerate of one another. Uh, we're all on different places of growth and uh, different places of wisdom and knowledge that you've given us for God. So just help us to be peaceful among one another. I know we talked about some controversial things on here today and that's okay because life is very controversial. Um, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your experiences. I thank you for the divine appointments that I was aware of today. And I just pray uh, forgiveness for the ones that I've missed in the past. But I know you're so good that in the foundation of the world, when you wrote down everything we were ever going to do, good and bad, and you recorded it in your book, you were also recording all those God moments that I was going to miss. And I'm sure that you were writing in other people that weren't going to miss it. And they were going to show up and take care of the thing that I missed. That's how awesome you are. Even when I miss it, you have a backup plan. So, but I'm greedy in this way. I don't want to miss God moments. So help me to walk around with my eyes open and my heart open. Help me not to miss God moments. Help the people that are watching a truck church to be aware of God moments. Don't let Satan beat them up with disappointment and thinking they have nothing to offer and they don't know enough. Anybody, any Christian can say, hey, Jesus sees you and Jesus loves you and so do I. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to have a seminary degree. Any Christian can say those phrases right there. And sometimes that's all it takes. That's all it took to break down a man that I've never seen before or may never see again this side of heaven. Jesus sees you. Jesus loves you. And it broke some hard places in his heart. And I don't know what you're going to do with it, but that's your business. So I just thank you again for Truck Church. Thank you for everybody that's so faithful to watch. Um, I pray that something was planted in their hearts. I pray that somebody was encouraged today. I pray that uh, life is different tomorrow when they open up their eyes and everywhere they find themselves, they realize that everywhere all day long is a divine appointment wherever they find themselves. And I pray that their eyes and hearts are open to see what you're wanting them to walk out. I just love you, God. Uh, thank you for everybody. Bless everybody this week. Um, thank you for the meteor shower tonight. I hope to catch some of that, Lord God. You're awesome. Just love you, God. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you for saving me, and don't let me ever take that for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, so I hope y'all are doing well. Still learning myself, Sam. Me too, buddy. Me too. I love y'all. Thank y'all for hanging in there with me. Hope y'all learned something. Hope you were encouraged, and uh, I hope that tomorrow when you open up your eyes, you look at life just a little bit differently, okay? So God bless y'all. Have a good night. We will see y'all next time. Love y'all. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for Jason and putting Jason in my life. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that, sweetie. Good night.